Okay, so let us continue uh, where we left off. So, if you recall that uh, I was discussing this, uh, this problem of uh, masses tied to springs and uh, they are all uh, placed on a circle uh, the way I have displayed it here. So, this is supposed to be uh, a, a caricature of a one dimensional solid. So, the, the masses would represent the uh, locations of the ions and the springs in between adjacent masses refer to the uh, restoring force that exists between ions. So, basically the chemical bonds uh, between uh, not just the ions, but the atoms themselves uh, because you know, you know that in equilibrium uh, the masses are exactly at the, uh, they are exactly equidistant from one another and uh, it is only when you displace them a little there is a restoring force uh, which allows them to come back to their original locations because uh, you know that a solid will remain a solid. Uh, you know even if you pump energy into the system all that happens is that that energy goes into uh, these uh, lattice vibrations. So, that is what these are. So, the, the masses oscillate about their equilibrium positions. So, uh, the mechanism that uh, achieves this is uh, modeled through a, a sequence of mass and spring uh, configurations and that is what I have shown here. So, you have mass tied to a spring which is an tied to another mass and so on. So, the question is uh, I want to not only study this system, but I, I specifically want to study the continuum limit of the system. So, what I mean by that is that uh, I want the uh, number of masses on this ring to become infinite but at the same time I want the circumference of the ring to become infinite in such a way that the number of masses per unit length which is the density of masses on the ring uh, is a constant. So, I keep the density fixed, the number of masses per unit length fixed, then I increase the perimeter or the circumference of the circle or the length of the ring, but at the same time I proportionately increase the number of masses. So, that is called the thermodynamic limit or the continuum limit in this case and uh, I would like to study that uh, limit. So, the way you study that is to uh, postulate. So, not only that I, I also want the distance between masses to uh, reduce uh, in such a way that I can model the masses as basically a continuum. So, that means the the mass of uh, the, the mass in between two springs ok. So, has, uh, has a um, is, is modeled by a density distribution. So, you have rho d x. So, the idea is that it is kind of uh, when the masses come close to one another they kind of merge into one another, but then at the same time the spring in between should also uh, somehow exist. So, the idea is that the spring constant should scale this way. So, the mass, so each of those masses are now going to be described by a density, ok. So, this is the density times dx. So, this is your dx, ok. So, the idea is that these things will come very close to another. So, that this is uh, this is at position x and this is at position x plus dx ok. So, that is your size of the size of your mass as it were. So, that is uh, defined by the density and the spring constant is also going to depend upon uh, dx in this manner. So, the implication is that you will be able to model the spring constant also as a distribution as a kind of a density ok. So, so you will see why I am doing this because, uh, so now the summation over uh, all the masses just becomes now an integration. Now, you see the successive masses are, are close so that uh, I can uh, choose to write the difference 
in this way. So, L is the distance between successive masses and because L is so much small compared to X, the implication is that in the end L tends to 0. So, if L tends to 0, this is going to be how it is. Okay. So, um, so if you accept this, then you will see that uh, you substitute all this, you substitute this here into this and uh, the kappa sub gets substituted there, I mean the uh, spring constant k sub gets substituted there and then this difference gets substituted here. So, in that case you will see that uh, the Lagrangian of the system instead of being this discrete sum is writable in this continuum fashion. So, it becomes an integral over the continuous position. So, x is a continuous location of each atom now which is described by a density distribution. So, now the discrete uh, Lagrange equation, the Euler Lagrange equations where which were earlier for discrete masses now has this uh, continuum reinterpretation. So, you see this is the continuum version of the discrete uh, Euler Lagrange equations. Now, if you go ahead and write this, uh, so you, you see that you can go ahead and evaluate this derivative for example and that is uh, from, from this uh, continuum version of the Lagrangian. So, if you evaluate this then uh, you will see clearly that uh, this is nothing but, so, so remember that uh, uh, d s dot x comma t d s dot y comma t is nothing but the Dirac delta of x minus y. So, you are going to use this uh, and then this is twice s dot into d s dot by d s dot y d s dot x by d s dot y. So, that is going to be Dirac delta x minus y and x, uh, x is integrated. So, x becomes y and uh, yeah, so I, I made a mistake here. So, this should be y. Okay. So, similarly here uh, if you go ahead and evaluate this you get uh, y there. Okay. So, that is going to be your Euler Lagrange equation. Uh, sorry, this, this is what uh, this is what you get by evaluating just, just this. Okay. So, this is just this. So, now uh, you then evaluate at the right hand side which is going to look like this okay. because uh, okay. So, how does that work? You are going to differentiate L with respect to S. So, the S dependence is only here. Remember that uh, it is S and S dot. So, the derivatives of S with respect to position are of course, uh, also dependent on x because they do not necessarily depend on the trajectory of the system. See remember that s dot is independent of s simply because knowing uh, s dot requires the no knowledge of the trajectory, but if you know s of x comma t at all values of x for a given t, you do not need the trajectory to evaluate d s by d x because that is by definition given for all x. So, it is it's unrelated to the trajectory. So, d s by d x is not independent of s, the two are related because you do not have to go through the trajectory to get that, but s dot is unrelated to s because the knowledge of s dot requires the knowledge of trajectory. So, that comes later, that is a consequence of the Lagrange equation. So, you do not, you are not uh, allowed to use that information in order to derive the Lagrange equations. Okay. So, that comes as a consequence or as a solution of the Lagrange equation, the trajectory. Okay. So, um, bottom line is that if you wish to evaluate the right hand side which is this, uh, so you are going to differentiate this with respect to uh, y and you see it is d s by d x and d s by d y. So, but then d s by d y as I said earlier for the same reason is the Dirac delta function and then uh, use the integration by parts and you keep in mind that the boundary terms are 0 because uh, we are going to postulate at the end points the displacements are 0. Okay. So, in that case uh, you are going to get this when you do that. So, uh, I realize that there are a number of steps which may 
be a little too quick for some of you, especially the integration by parts and throwing away the boundary terms. So, I strongly encourage you to uh, work this out carefully. Uh, alternatively, I am going to in include this as part of some assignments or tutorials that you are going to encounter in due course. Okay, so, bottom line is that this is what this is and uh, when you go ahead and substitute, so you go ahead and so the Lagrange equations would say that the time derivative of uh, this quantity is your generalized momentum is your generalized force and which is we have just calculated this way. So, this is what we end up getting and this is nothing but the famous wave equation. Okay, so, what have we succeeded in proving? We have succeeded in proving that the continuum version of the mass and spring configuration, the continuum version of the one dimensional solid uh, leads to displacements that obey the wave equation. So, that is hardly surprising because after all what we expect uh, the uh, displacements to be is basically we expect the displacements to constitute sound waves in other words or be the generator of sound waves. So, the displacements generate vibrations that propagate along the solid and those vibrations are precisely the sound waves and it is not surprising that uh, those displacements should obey the wave equation and we have succeeded in rigorously proving that indeed they do. And not only that remember that uh, the wave equation tells you that the speed with which these waves propagate is determined by uh, a constant right which is uh, which is basically kappa by rho equals c square c is your speed of sound so that's your speed of sound that's the speed with which waves propagate in your uh, continuum solid okay so where the the masses of the atoms are kind of uh, the masses are so close and the springs are pretty strong even though they are zero length they are very strong and then that leads to a kind of uh, a continuum version of a solid. So, that is a translationally invariant solid. See, uh, normally solids have this discrete translational invariance that you have to you know shift the all, all the atoms by a lattice distance in order for it to look the same. But now any amount of shift makes it look the same because it is a continuum analog of a discrete solid. So, now uh, the other example uh, which is of interest is uh, a mass uh, falling through a fluid. So, this is of interest because uh, this leads to the diffusion equation. Okay. So, earlier we saw that uh, the continuum version of the one dimensional solid undergoing lattice vibration leads to the uh, wave equation right. So, the continuum version of another uh, example leads to the diffusion equation. So, the problem I have in mind is uh, imagine uh, a mass uh, falling in a dense fluid ok. So, but then I am going to uh, imagine several such masses. So, you see uh, I, I gave this initial example because if there is a mass falling in a dense fluid we all know well at least uh, empirically it is known that uh, the force uh, the drag force acting on that mass is proportional to the speed of that mass in the uh, relative to the fluid uh, and it is a kind of a drag. So, that means there is a negative sign associated with it. So, now what we are going to assume is that uh, the uh, a similar drag exists with respect to molecules in a viscous liquid. So, here there is some external mass falling in a in a fluid in a liquid in a viscous liquid. So, that uh, that mass is acted upon by a drag force by the liquid. But then you can imagine that mass that is falling to be one of those molecules of the liquid itself. So, in which case what you will have to do is that there are many such molecules in the liquid and we assume that each of those uh, molecules exerts force on its neighboring molecule 
which is proportional to the difference in the speeds of the two molecules. So, if the so if relative, uh, so if V1 minus V2 is the relative velocity of molecule 1 relative to molecule 2, so there is going to be a force, uh, a drag force on molecule 1 uh, which is uh, given by this. Now, you ask yourself what is the uh, classical equation that you can write down force equation. So, mass times acceleration of the nth such mass is going to be. So, again here I imagine uh, there is a kind of a one dimensional procession of uh, masses. So, you have the nth mass, this is the n plus 1 mass, this is the n minus 1 mass and so on. So, uh, so this is going to exert, so you see the mass times acceleration of this is going to uh, be related to the drag exerted on this mass due to this mass and also the drag on this mass due to the other one. So, both of them kind of um, cause deceleration of uh, this uh, particular nth mass because they are kind of rub against each other. So, there is a kind of a deceleration caused by the fact that there is a viscous uh, rubbing against one another. So, each of those masses can uh, be acted upon by an external force. So, the external force is determined by something called F. Okay, F is the external force that is acting on the molecule. These are the forces acting on the nth molecule. There is a drag due to its neighbors and there is the external force. So, now I am going to do the same thing I did earlier. So, I am going to imagine that all these molecules are very, very close to each other. So, that now I describe this whole system as a fluid rather than a discrete collection of molecules. So, in order to describe a fluid, I will have to first imagine that is made of discrete uh, molecules and then I imagine that they are so close to one another that uh, they effectively merge into one another and become a fluid. So, so in order to do that, I am going to postulate that there is a small dx. So, L is the distance between successive, successive masses which is I am going to write as an infinitesimal uh, dx. So, then uh, my uh, x is, uh, is basically proportional to that dx. So, it is uh, it's some, some integer times dx. So, now uh, you see that the uh, as usual the difference between the velocities of the successive molecules is uh, therefore given by the successive displacements is x and x minus l. Okay. So, I will have to keep, keep things up to second order because you will see the first order terms cancel out because they appear symmetrically like this. So, if I write down uh, for uh, the drag acting on n due to n minus 1 and drag acting on n due to n plus 1, you will see the first order terms actually cancel out. So, I have to actually go up to the second order. So, this is the second order. So, you see when, when I substitute that, so when I substitute this and this here, so I substitute that here and then this one here, okay. then you will see that the first order term which is this cancels out. So, then I am left with this. Okay. So, that is the that is the drag term. So, the, this is the drag due to both the n plus 1 and the nth term. So, this is of course, remains as it is this is the external force that is acting and this is nothing but the rate of change of uh, the speed of the nth mass which is at x. So, now this is the famous driven diff diffusion equation. So, if there is no external force acting, this would be the usual diffusion equation and uh, this is nothing but uh, the constant. I mean, this is a constant. This, so, this is called the diffusion constant, okay, k l squared by rho l. So, that is k l by rho is basically the diffusion constant, okay. So, that is I have called it eta. So, that is the diffusion constant and this is the driven acceleration. So, this is the, the acceleration of the system because of some external driving force. So, this is the driven diffusion equation. 
So, all these uh, examples are meant to illustrate the uh, way in which you approach a system possessing infinitely many degrees of freedom starting from the more familiar system possessing a discrete or even a finite number of degrees of freedom because that is what this course is all about. The title of this course is dynamics of classical and quantum fields. So, the word field implies that there are infinitely many degrees of freedom, but then I have to motivate that infinity because not only it is infinite, it is actually a continuum kind of infinity. So, it is important for me to motivate the progression to a dynamical system with a continuously in infinity number of degrees of freedom starting from a point of view which is very familiar to those taking this course and that is a system, a dynamical system with finitely many degrees of freedom. So, I hope in the last two examples which uh, involve deriving the continuum wave equation from uh, by modeling the lattice vibration of a one dimensional solid and uh, deriving the diffusion equation right uh, by modeling the motion of uh, mass in a viscous fluid. It is basically the motion of the viscous fluid itself you could think of it that way. So, bottom line is that uh, I have been uh, successful in uh, deriving these two uh, continuum versions starting from a discrete picture which should be more familiar. Okay, so, now let us proceed to another example which is slightly more complicated and also slightly less illuminative compared to the first two examples. So, perhaps I am going to skip this because uh, I think it is uh, more uh, technical rather than uh, illustrative. So, it is kind of uh, you can easily drown in the details, but it is uh, it is still worthwhile uh, thinking about this. So, this refers to the uh, the motion of a slack rope tied between two poles. So, if it is completely taut and, and uh, then you know just waves propagate on that, but then if it is not completely taut a lot of degrees of freedom exist which you have to take carefully take into account. It is not particularly illuminative, so I am going to skip this and allow you to have a look at it on your own. But now let us go to the last example. So, so if you start reading this paragraph it says lest the reader goes away with the impression that only system uh, that are related to everyday tangible objects such as masses, springs, ropes, pulleys, etc., are the basis for writing down continuum classical field theories. Okay, so, so just so that you do not go away with that impression, now I am going to give you an unusual example. So, the unusual example is the following. So, imagine I have a complex uh, scalar field. So, I am imagine psi is a complex function of x and t. So, then I have two independent uh, quantities one is psi and psi star. So, the, they are independent because you know each complex number can be written as uh, the sum of real and imaginary parts which can of course, be independent of one another. So, now I am going to uh, identify q 1 with the psi and q 1 dot which is the generalized velocity to the rate of change of the psi with respect to time. So, similarly, I am going to identify q 2 with the complex conjugate which I told you is unrelated to psi because uh, you know the real and imaginary parts of psi can be completely unrelated. So, now q 2 is my psi star and q 2 dot is the rate of change of that with respect to time. So, if I do that uh, then uh, uh, I can uh, go ahead and uh, write down uh, I am going to first write down a po or rather postulate a Lagrangian of psi. Uh, so, you see just like a, a Lagrangian is supposed to be a function of q 1, q 2 and q 1 dot and q 2 dot, but keep in mind that now q 1 is psi, uh, q 2 is psi star and q 1 dot is d y d t of psi and q 2 dot is d y d t of psi star. 
I am going to postulate that this L which is a function of q1, q2, q1 dot, q2 dot is uh, actually given by this. So, I'm, this is a postulate. So, let us assume that if, if L is given this way, so the question is what are the Lagrange equations of this Lagrangian. So, I, I think I have left it to you as an exercise to show that the Lagrange equations of this are nothing but the Schrodinger time dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay. So, that is kind of funny because we, we associate time dependent Schrodinger equation with quantum mechanics and yet the Euler Lagrange equations are basically the classical equations of motion. So, the, there is a there is a reason why we are able to do this and that is there is one reason is purely mathematical and that is that a, any dynamical equation can always be thought of as a consequence or the uh, uh, basically as a consequence of an extremum principle something that minimizes and some version of an action. So, it so happens that you can always do this even with the uh, time dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay. So, uh, so I will allow you to read this paragraph uh, on your own because I think uh, you know if I start discussing this it will be a little premature, but I think you should go ahead and read this paragraph which partially tries to explain this uh, funny mixture of formalisms or points of view. On the one hand you have Schrodinger equation which is purely describes the quantum mechanical system if psi is your wave function and yet the Lagrangian, the Euler Lagrange equations are classical. That is uh, not surprising because you see after all q1 is not something very familiar, it is I have written down a, a q1 as a complex number. So, we hardly ever do that in classical mechanics. So, this is just a a kind of a, it, there is hardly any classical mechanics here except that I have just utilized the idea of Euler Lagrange equations uh, and in order to simply generate Schrodinger's equation. But nevertheless, I think you should read this paragraph and uh, see if it makes sense to you, and then later on we will come back to this because right now it is premature for me to discuss exactly what the ramifications are of this. Okay, so now, uh, now that I just briefly mentioned to you that pretty much any dynamical equation can be thought of as a consequence of an extremum principle, this remark uh, finds its a very dramatic application in a very famous old problem called the Brachistochrone problem. So, this famous Brachistochrone problem refers to this question. Uh, the uh, brachistochrone is a Greek word brachistos means the shortest and chronos means time. So, basically this, this problem asks what is the uh, path that uh, a mass uh, sliding along a curve should take in order for it to reach the uh, its destination in the shortest possible time. So, the idea that uh, this problem has in mind is that you have a starting point and you have an ending point at a lower potential energy. So, imagine that uh, there is a mass uh, which starts off here and wants to reach a lower height. So, so the mass wants to reach here, but it can uh, go through many paths. So, like so you imagine there is a tube connecting these two paths and the tube is completely frictionless. Okay. So, you will have to arrange some tubes uh, which connect this po point and this point and you allow the mass to slide in, in that tube and this tube has this shape, but ensure that there are no dissipative forces, it is completely frictionless, it simply slides frictionlessly. So, now you ask yourself uh, what is the path which makes the time taken for it to reach this point from this point start and finish. Okay, so, uh, what is the path, what is the shape of the path? Of course, uh, if you did not already know the answer to this and you are not the person to first uh, make a detailed analysis before giving an answer, if you were to simply guess without further information or prior knowledge, you would simply say at least I would say straight line. So, I would say well, 
the tube that looks like a straight line connecting the start to finish is the one that gives you the smallest uh, time possible. That's of course true uh, if you were, if there was no gravitational field I suppose. So, but then now there is a gravitational field so that's not at all clear. So, this question needs an analysis before giving an answer and this analysis involves what is called the variational method or basically a method which involves minimizing a functional. So, remember I told you what a functional is in the last class. So, it is it takes a function as an input and gives a number as an output. So, this the solution of this problem involves minimizing the time taken. Now, the time taken is a function null of the path that the particle takes. So, the path is a function and that is the input. So, you give a path and the output is the time taken which is a number. So, as you vary the path, as you change the shape of the path, this time taken changes. So, you have to vary the path until the time taken is the minimum possible. So, so therefore, this is called the variational method. So, you keep varying the path until the time taken is the minimum. So, let me uh, proceed and try to uh, first write down the relation between the time taken and the path travel. So, first I have to do that. It is only after I do that then I will be successful in finding out how to minimize uh, the time taken. So, to do that it is clear that I have to draw my free body diagram. So, I have this uh, uh, let us see if I have shown a picture perhaps not. So, in that case I am going to write draw the picture right now. So, this is my uh, mass and you see that this is uh, this has a velocity v x and there is a velocity v y. So, now the force is acting one is m g okay, and then there is this normal force. Okay. So, the normal force has two components uh, one is horizontal. So, that will give me uh, n cos theta. So, n cos theta will be the force in the in the x direction and that will cause mass times acceleration in the x direction. And the force in the y direction is uh, n sin theta, but then there is also a minus mg force because that is pointing downward. So, there is an n sin theta which points up, but there is a minus mg that points down put together is responsible for mass times acceleration in the y direction. So, now I can eliminate n and then write this way. Okay. So, because uh, I usually do not care about n, I want to know uh, what is the time taken uh, when the path is given. But then keep in mind that uh, tan theta is a variable because that is the angle made by the normal which uh, keeps changing directions to the horizontal. So, therefore, uh, you see by just the geometry it is clear that dx by dy is your, so if this is y versus x, okay, so you, you just go a little bit uh, in this direction, right. So, if you go in this direction, so this is your uh, dx, dx and then this is your dy, right. So, so your dx by dy is your minus tan theta. So, just work that out because this is your uh, this is your theta. Okay. So, your d x by d y is, uh, is minus tan theta because these two are equal and one is negative of the other. Well, these two are 90 degrees apart not equal. So, therefore, therefore uh, d x by d t is nothing but d y by d t into tan theta with a minus sign. So, then I can rewrite my uh, v x in terms of v y and theta. Okay. 
so now uh, then I am going to define V as uh, the magnitude of the V vector which is square root of V x squared plus V y squared which allows me to of course write, rewrite V x and V y like this. So when I do that I can go ahead and uh, rewrite tan theta as uh, so I am going to write at minus tan theta as dx by dt divided by dy by dt but what is this? This is nothing but Vx by Vy. So Vx by Vy is a minus tan theta. So minus Vx by Vy equals tan theta. Okay. So that is equal to uh, dVy plus. So I just multiply by delta t. I get this equation. Okay. So so now I can go ahead and rewrite this like this. Okay but then this is nothing but dy. So if I integrate this I get uh, a conservation law. This I, I should not have done it this way because it is fairly obvious that this is how it should be. This is just conservation of energy. If I multiply m on both sides this is half m v squared plus m g y equals constant. So I, I should have started here. Okay. So this is nothing but conservation of energy and this is how you derive it. But uh, if you already are willing to assume this because this is the first integral of the Newton's loss. So if you can always assume this, well you should be always be able to assume this then it is better to start this way. So if you start this way then it is clear that uh, the, the magnitude of the velocity is now uh, nothing but ds along this uh, along the trajectory along the curved path by d t is your magnitude of the velocity. So that is going to be just uh, so h is your initial height. So I am going to assume that this is my this is my y. It starts from y equal to 0 and then falls like this. So uh, and when it uh, falls like this uh, it is uh, it is and this uh, this is uh, this distance is some h. Okay. So it, it ends up somewhere there. Okay. So then its potential energy here relative to what it is here is uh, mgh. Okay. So it is uh, so it is half mv squared equals mgh minus this and then you integrate this out. So this y is now a function of s this is the path. So if I specify so your s is your parameter along the path. So the parametric form of the trajectory is y versus s. So x versus s, y versus s is the is the parametric form of this curve. So so now I can go ahead and find the time taken, which is the initial time to final time, starting from the initial parameter to the final parameter. Okay. So I'm going to assume that. Uh, Initially, the particle is, is at zero comma h, okay, and then finally, the particle is at uh, l comma zero. So that means it has traveled horizontally at distance l, and then dropped by an amount h vertically. So if that's the case, then uh, my initial and final parameters are now expressible in terms of. So now I can go ahead and rewrite in terms of uh, the x value itself rather than the parameter. Okay. So so I'm going to rewrite ds in terms of dx. So ds ds is nothing but ds uh, ds by dx into dx. Okay. So it's ds by dx into ds dx. So ds by dx is basically this this much. So it is uh, so this is nothing but ds by dx. So ds by dx into ds dx is ds. So this is as it is, and now this is a y is a function of x rather than s. I mean this is abuse of notation. You have to assume that I have reinterpreted this as a function of x. So actually by this I really mean this y s x this one. I mean this is I mean I meant this I meant this not this but then this is shorthand for that. Okay, so now uh, so now I have y versus x which is the traditional way of thinking about uh, the trajectory. Now uh, 
in order to find y versus x which will tell me the path that particle has to take, I have to vary y of x until this capital T which is the time taken becomes a minimum. Okay. So, that is the so called variational approach to this problem. So, I have so this is you can see clearly this is a function null now. So, give me a path y of x. Okay. So, that path um, well that path is of course, uh, that uh, when y of 0 is 0 and y of l is h. So, it is a it is a path all the paths that I am going to consider will have this property that it y of y when x equals 0 is 0, y when x equal to l is h. So, this is a given. So, within assuming that this is given there will be many paths which will obey this property which will connect uh, 0 comma h and l comma 0. So, there will be many paths which will connect these two points. The question is that which of these paths will minimize t. So, that t is a function null of the path. So, I keep varying the paths and the minimum of uh, the path which minimizes t is the path that the particle will take. Okay. That is not the right way of saying it, that is the path which will minimize the time taken. So, it will it will take that path assuming there is a tube connecting the starting point and the ending point in the shape of that path. So, you can choose to force the particle to move in a different path by connecting a different shape tube. But the bottom line is that you are doing this experiment to find out which of those paths will ensure that the particle reaches in the quickest possible time. So, you have to select the shape of the tube in such a way that the particle reaches its destination uh, in the shortest possible time. So, now all you have to do is vary t is the time taken uh, until the uh, uh, time taken becomes minimum. So, in other words delta t should be 0. So, that is the necessary condition for minimizing the path. Okay. So, now in the next class I am going to tell you how to uh, impose this condition delta t equals 0 and uh, get the uh, path which uh, is going to make t a minimum. So, remember that making delta t equals 0 guarantees that the path is either a minimum or a maximum. It does not guarantee that it is a minimum, but to, to make sure it is a minimum you have to uh, do the second derivative and make sure it is positive. So, that is something I have left to the exercises, and, but anyway intuitively it is fairly obvious that whatever you get is really the minimum. So, in the next class I am going to show you how this uh, how to implement this condition delta t equals 0 and then obtain the path which minimizes the uh, time taken. So, that is the, the solution to that is uh, something called a catenary and uh, and that is going to uh, that is a famous solution to this famous problem. Okay, so, I am going to stop here and in the next class I will finish this Brachistochrone problem and then we will move on to other topics. Okay, thank you, hope to see you in the next class. Mm -hmm.